Project Refocus, which stands for Racial Ethnic Framing of Community Informed and Unifying Surveillance, is an initiative funded by CDC and the CDC Foundation and co-led by Dr. Chandra Ford, Director of UCLA's Center for the Study of Racism, Social Justice and Health, and Professor at Emory University, and Dr. Monica Ponder, Assistant Professor of Health Communication and Culture at Howard University. Project Refocus provides a real-time crisis monitoring and educational resource for public health practitioners. These tools are necessary to adequately monitor social stigma and support historically marginalized and disproportionately affected populations during public health crises. The Project Refocus conceptual model takes a novel approach to public health crisis communication. It seeks to bridge data across health inequities and disease trends with social listening and conversations with communities that helps us to understand the lived experiences and cultural context of crisis events and the true socio-ecological collaboration in identifying public health interventions and timely emergency response. Racism, both interpersonal and structural, negatively affects the mental and physical health of millions of people, preventing them from attaining their highest level of health, consequently affecting the health of our nation. The challenge we seek to address is how these realities impact crisis communication practice, how we can be more responsive given present cultural realities. This conceptual model attempts to pull together what Project Refocus has determined are critical inputs for optimizing communication about health crises. This model is intended to be pertinent, not just for COVID, but also for other health crises or disasters. To detect these co-occurring crises, racism and a health crisis like COVID, monitoring must include data on inequities and disease trends, coupled with output that reflects the community social media, mass media, as well as input from the communities who experience health disparities. These together can help identify solutions to the identified health crises. In phase one of this work, we assessed media frames during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. We found that while mainstream press consistently covered the progress of the crisis in terms of health risk, prevention and education and scientific concerns, it was ethnic media that contextualized this information in terms of their economic consequences, legal ramifications and societal frames. As a final layer of the project refocus vision for the real time public health monitoring and community informed response, we recognize that journalists and com community media play a critical role in helping communities to signal when in distress and in complement with citizen journalists help to amplify the needs, wins, and interests of communities, which is why we are here today. In this third of four virtual community conversations, Project Refocus will explore citizen journalism's and community media's role during a public health crisis. It's only fitting that during Women's History Month, we have a dynamic group of women scholars, journalists, executives, and creatives to lead this conversation. First, we will hear from Dr. Lauren Saxton Coleman, she will provide historical context on the role of alternative and community media in community building and community actions with particular emphasis on the black press. Dr. Coleman is an assistant professor of communication culture and media studies at Howard University. Dr. Coleman explores how black communities exercise contingent agency via acts of resistance and community formations, transformations via media practice and her work has been published in a number of peer review journals. We now welcome Dr. Lauren Saxton Coleman to the stage. Good afternoon. First, I just wanna say thank you for the opportunity to participate in this timely um, and important conversation on the role of community media during public health crises. I enter into this dialogue as a Black cultural studies and media studies scholar. I'm primarily interested in media and conceptualizing media, not just as a tool to disseminate information, but media as a organizing community building practice. So today I wanna to provide some context on the emergence of definition of community and alternative media organizations with a particular emphasis on the black press. First, I want to highlight 
um, what are community media? What are alternative media? Oftentimes people ask what makes media community or what makes alternative media alternative? There are varying definitions in the literature. Um, and I wanna just highlight some key characteristics of each as you hear, as you see here, excuse me, on the screen. In looking at these key characteristics, you notice some similarities between the two. Oftentimes when we talk about community and alternative media, it's in comparison with mainstream media. I want us to try to resist the urge in doing that, particularly as it, as it pertains to size and scope. Because when we constantly compare community and alternative media to mainstream media, we run the risk of delegitimizing, deprioritizing, and even minimizing the credibility of the vital role that these kinds of media organizations play in our community. So thinking about the, the last slide that kind of highlighted some of the key characteristics, we ask ourselves, what are the, the similar characteristics between the two? While not synonymous, certainly there are some similarities. First, in both community and alternative media organizations, community members are humanized. We are written about as people, not objects. We are people with agency in our own lives. And more importantly, we become the experts in the experiences and the issues that we deal with in our communities. Two, across both community and alternative media organizations, um, stories that are told about our communities counter often negative, um, crippling, or limiting, or one-sided stories about us in mainstream media. Also, importantly, the audiences, the readers, the listeners of community and alternative media organizations are transformed um, from passive media consumers to actually a part of the media production process. People in the community often work for um, or community and alternative media organizations and are seen as credible sources for information. Um, and so one of the key characteristics that I showed earlier is that across both community and alternative of media, community members are seen as experts and as officials. And so they're often included in these stories alongside what we would consider or what mainstream considers elite um, or official experts. For Black communities in particular, our engagement with alternative media is not new. Um, the Black press, with first emerged in 1827 with Freedom's Journal, um, is an exemplar of how alternative media are not just tools to push information to people, but rather active practices and process, processes that participate in the formation and the uplifting of community. So the Black press um, is a source of strength. Um, it is a resource that helps still even today foster excellence and economic growth. Um, it challenges mainstream narratives um, and uh, news and, and traditional news about Black people and Black communities. And most importantly, um, it challenges and encourages Black audiences to get involved, civically engaged in political and social and economic movements for this larger fight for equity um, and justice. And so what is the relevance to all this in time of crisis, which is why we're here um, today? Crisis Com literature suggests that in time of crisis, we need trusted leaders to provide information that can literally help save our lives and our communities. For marginalized communities, this need intensifies. And so Dr. Goodman hinted to some of the early research did in that we did in phase one of this project, but I just wanted to highlight it here. Um, we found in some pre preliminary work done in went fall, winter of 2020 around the early vaccine rollout that the Black press covered COVID-19 as a societal problem, which shows or provides an example of the way in which um, this pandemic was contextualized in larger uh, societal problems and structures of race, of class, and of politics. Um, many of these stories highlighted the, I, the theme that Black people and Black communities do not trust the government, um, the vaccine, but what's important in understanding this coverage is that it was contextualized, it was historicized, it was not an individual problem that Black communities or people didn't trust government or science, but these stories provided necessary and important historical context. The sources that were used were both medical experts and community members alike. 
Um, and more importantly, there was call for equitable vaccine rollout. Um, and so what are my recommendations thinking about the role of community media in times of public health crises? Public health officials and organizations need to establish relationships with community and alternative media before a crisis hits. Certainly, we're three years into this pandemic, um, but if we want to engage marginalized communities, um, community and alternative media are trusted sources and leaders. Oftentimes, people who work within these organizations live, serve, and engage with community. And so these organizations don't need to just be seen as a, a, a place to push information, but rather establish collaborative relationships so organizations can think expansively along with these leaders about how to create more culturally and holistic risk and crisis communication strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. We will now introduce our remaining panelists. A leader in community media, Audrey Duncan has worked with BronxNet TV since its first broadcast in 1993. In her current role as Director of Community Affairs, she builds and strengthens partnerships with community organizations, residents, and officials across the Bronx, New York. We will then hear from Kavitha Rajogopalan, is the founding director of the Asian Media Initiative, dedicated to organizing and building sustainability in community media for and by Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders across the U.S. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Nation, Atlantic City Lab, and she was previously an op-ed columnist for The Observer, PBS, and Newsday. We'll then hear from Cheryl Thompson Morton. She is the Black Media Initiative Director for the Center for Community Media at the Newmark J School and leads the Pointer Institute's Transforming Crime Coverage to Public Safety Coverage class. Cheryl is the form former Program Manager for the Lindfest Institute of Journalism in Philadelphia, where she created, launched, and executed several initiatives to increase equity in news media. We'll then hear from Ebony Blanding, who is a writer director from Atlanta, Georgia, whose work seeks to tell the stories about Black girls and women coming of age on their own terms. Blanding has helmed branded content for Rolling Stone and documentaries for major artists. We will conclude our conversation with Sally Lehrman, who founded and leads the Trust Project. She has earned accolades for her reporting on medicine and science, including a Peabody Award, DuPont Columbia, and the John S. Knight Fellowship with bylines in Scientific American, Nature, Health, and the public radio documentary series, The DNA Files, distributed by NPR, among others. We will now hear from Ms. Audrey Duncan with Brock's Neck TV, who will share how they provided updates during the COVID-19 pandemic and how they encourage viewers to focus on their health and well-being. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Project We Focus for inviting Bronxnet to be a part of this community conversation. Okay. So Bronxnet um, was founded actually 30 years ago um, to serve the people of the Bronx with public access television, as well as we decided to be a community TV station where we would also produce content and just really work with the organizations to um, work on some of the issues affecting the borough. We um, provide the Bronx with media production training, access to technology and television, television channels. You can see the channels listed here. We're on the Verizon Fio system, as well as the Optimum system in the Bronx. And also we actually stream many of our programs on our website as well. Um, we carry out our services um, with uh, several purposes in mind. Uh, we're producing public affairs programming that address the concerns, interests, and cultures of the people of the Bronx. We're providing media training and technological resources for individual residents and nonprofit organizations interested in producing their own programming. And once they complete that training, they then get to produce their own content. We contribute to media workforce development in a very big way. We train high school and college students in the technological, artistic, managerial, and journalistic aspects of television production and broadcasting. Um, and we contribute to community development through all the 
content we produce as well as through our workforce development services. Um, our resources are many and growing. We have state-of-the-art production studios, field production camera kits that are circulated to the people who take our training so that they can produce their programs. Um, we have post-production stations and apps and always try to keep up to date with that and change as necessary. We um, now have immersive media production stages um, for virtual reality, augmented reality, and all sorts of new things that people can do. We're at three locations. Our longest running location is the Bronx, Network, Bronx Network Operations in the Northwest Bronx, based at Lehman College. Um, in 2015, we opened our BronxNet Windows on the East Bronx studio at Mercy College in the Hutchinson Metro Center. And soon this coming summer, um, we will open the BronxNet Media and Technology Studios at La Central in the South Bronx. La Central is a huge um, housing development, affordable housing development that was uh, developed by a private partner in conjunction with the city of New York, and we were happy to get space there. In addressing community problems through our signature programs, as we call them, um, we focus on many, many issues, but I'll just list a few here. That's definitely health. health. Health has always been big on our radar. Gun violence reduction, because you know it's such a problem across the nation. Social justice more and more, especially all the stuff that arose during the pandemic. We just saw a need and actually created a couple of shows that focus primarily on social justice. And we have always um, made sure to promote civic awareness and voter literacy through debates and other voter education programs. Uh, we work with issues in a number of ways, um, as I mentioned, through stories and discussions on our professionally produced signature programs um, through the training um, and empowerment that we give to Bronx residents when they take our classes and some of them look at our signature programs as an, as an example of what they want to contribute. So they, many of them create programs that focus on the issues and you know, really certain segments of the population that they feel like they should speak to. We have many partnerships with local and citywide organizations where we produce events together and definitely produce content together and constantly have experts on our shows to talk about key issues. Um, one of the reasons we, you know, chose to focus on health in a big way is that since 2009, according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, they've ranked the Bronx number 62 out of 62 New York State counties in health outcomes, um, which is not good. So, you know, there are many people like the borough president who definitely agree that that is not acceptable and do so much to work to change that. Um, so working with health organizations and experts to just provide information that will um, encourage people to take care of their health personally, um, that will let people know what they can do to exercise their rights when it comes to getting proper health care from institutions, um, you know, focusing on some of the health concerns that really plague the Bronx, like asthma, diabetes, heart conditions are big, nutrition, and sometimes the nutrition problem um, also stems from not having enough quality like supermarkets in neighborhoods. So, you know, it's definitely both advocacy and just personal education when it comes to us reaching out to improve the health picture in the Bronx. Um, so uh, during the pandemic, um, we worked, most of us, we were all working remotely and but within a couple of weeks we said you know we have to continue providing the services that we provided so um, we continue to serve the Bronx with content and we continue to serve our individual residents with with train, media training that they were used to getting so that they could produce their own programs we had all sorts of virtual classes we taught people how they could use whatever they had around them their device um, whatever lamp they could find we told them how to um, use those items to get the best video quality, audio quality, so they can continue to do their programs and share them on BronxNet. We um, tackled the problems in many ways. We had something called, we call BOPAS, the BronxNet on-screen public awareness alert zone, um, where we had up to the minute 
uh, information from CDC and other health agencies, just keeping people informed um, so that they could know what's going on and know what actions they might take next. We had um, health experts appear regularly on our signature shows, also giving updates, information. We had live feeds of the, um, you know, usually daily uh, briefings that our New York state governor, as well as our New York city mayor were giving. And we had partnerships with the New York city department of health, as well as other entities where we shared information on COVID testing, COVID vaccines, and just really keeping that met those messages um, in front of people on our screens. We continue to focus on health, um, you know, even though we've worked our way out of the pandemic, because as, as I mentioned, it was always a big issue for us. Um, and um, these are just a few of the ways, there are many more. We have a partnership with a local hospital, Montefiore, where we, um, you know, their experts promote healthy living, um, health equity, big topic, so that people can fight for their rights and then get equitable healthcare. Um, we produce forums together with them, um, along with elected officials to, um, in theaters like uh, the one at Hostos Community College where we had a big audience there and we televised it so that people who couldn't be there could get the information. We have a fun show, which we had for a number of years with, um, if any of you remember, a hip hop uh, legend, pioneer, Grandmaster Melly Mel. He's really into fitness now. So he does a fitness show where he's really in a fun way with that same vigor <laughs> that he put into his um, songs. Um, he encourages people to stay fit and eat healthy. We have a partnership with New York City agencies, particularly through the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit, and they tie us to many other city agencies. Um, we're working with them now to help organize an all-day health awareness event that will actually take place on our April 1st. And what we will do there is um, that we will have many health information stations and fun activities, and we're going to um, produce and broadcast all that information so that people can really take advantage of all the expert knowledge and fitness tips and all the sessions that are happening there. And, you know, we will continue to do that and so much more. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, Ms. Duncan. Up next, we have Kavitha Rajokopalan, who will highlight how Asian community media have responded to ongoing and converging public health crises affecting AAPI communities across the U.S., from COVID-19 and anti-Asian hate to hunger, diabetes, heart health, and more. Thank you so much for having me today. It's a pleasure to be in conversation with so many brilliant folks, especially so many experts in Black media. I feel very strongly that Asian media has a lot to learn from the power and legacy of Black media and the Black press. And just keeping the community informed and safe and embedding it within a wider history. Um, I'd love to just start by introducing you all to the Asian Media Initiative at CCM. If we can go to the next slide. We launched the Asian Media Initiative in September of 2022, following in the footsteps of the 2018 launch of the Latino Media Initiative, and the Black Media Initiative, which launched in 2020 at CCM. And we launched with a similar goal, um, only our goal is largely focused around bringing visibility as well as sustainability to an overlooked, under-resourced, and still largely trusted essential news ecosystem for and by immigrants and communities of color. Um, and we wanna focus on AAPI communities. Given the enormous ethnic and linguistic diversity, as well as widespread disinformation and political polarization at play in these communities, we are also dedicated to networking and organizing the sector to identify shared needs and to bring resources to diverse AAPI community media. I want to give you a sense of the next slide. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of what we're doing so far and what the ecosystem looks like. One of our first tasks really is to actually understand the ecosystem as it stands so that we can better understand its capacity to meet the news and information needs of the nearly 25 million AAPI in the US today. This heat map that you see here is a representation of preliminary findings from our in-progress research 
to create a national media map and directory of AAPI community media. This will be the first of its kind uh, across the nation. And the final version of this map will, of course, include searches of all US territories and freely associated states as well. As you can see from this heat map, the AAPI media ecosystem is vast, but it is uneven. So far, we have located some 560 AAPI news outlets in 32 states and in the uh, District of Columbia, and they publish in about 34 different languages. Many AAPI communities, however, have no, no in-language or relevant local news sources, and many have lost the sources that they have. The majority of AAPI community media do cluster in six states where we have the longest standing AAPI populations, and they primarily serve Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, Filipino, and Indian American communities. Next slide, please. Asian Americans are predicted to be the largest U.S. immigrant group in 2050, by 2050. They are the fastest growing immigrant population in the U.S. today, and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities are growing across the mainland as well, as, as they are impacted by climate crises and, uh, and labor migration challenges. For example, the Marshall Islands experienced a nuclear disaster, and so there's a very large Marshallese community in Arkansas, for example, which only has one news source. There are also major income and health disparities within the AAPI community as well, as well as between the AAPI population and the wider US population. What you'll see here is that income inequality is a major pronounced issue in the community. AAPI occupy some of the highest earners, uh, are the, high, the top quintile of the highest earners uh, in the United States, but this population earns 16 times what the bottom quintile of AAPI communities earn. There are many prevalent health conditions in AAPI communities, and many of these are able, they act as comorbidities during health crises like COVID-19. And as climate change and political violence sweep Asia, growing authoritarianism and fascism sweep Asia, a growing percentage of these communities are undocumented, or refugees and asylum seekers. Some of the largest resettled refugee populations are Asian American and experience multiple intersecting vulnerabilities. A couple of stats I'd like to highlight for you here is that among the age, women the ages of 15 and 24, Asian Americans have the highest suicide mortality rates across all eight racial and ethnic groups. And where one in 10 white Americans use tobacco, one in seven AAPI do. If you overlay this map on the previous slide's heat map, you can also see that the states with the largest percentage of the lowest income AAPI are also those with the fewest community media resources. Next slide, please. So let's take a quick look at how COVID-19 impacted AAPI and some of the factors of why they experienced disproportionately high rates of infection and mortality. AAPI faced disproportionately high rates of COVID-19 in large part because of structural, systemic, and cultural exposures. AAPI were less likely than white Americans to test for COVID-19, but they were nearly twice as likely to test positive when they did, and much more likely to require hospitalization. Some 29% of AAPI live in multi-generational homes, contributing to the spread across generations and communities, and including to vulnerable elders and immune compromised members of families inside communities. And more than 4 million AAPI manned the front lines as essential workers, working in food service, delivery, in healthcare, and as care workers in homes. You'll see here that the overall, uh, the, uh, the, the increase in the overall death rate during COVID-19 was 35% greater than in the previous years. I wanna pull one stat out here just to share with you and give you a little bit of a sense of the discrepancy in coverage between mainstream and Asian American media. One stat that we found is that in September, 2020, the National Nurses United reported that while they just made up for 4% of registered nurses in the US, 
Filipino Americans accounted for 32% of nurse lives lost to COVID-19. And we rarely saw stories about these losses outside of community media. Next slide, please. In this, I would like to showcase for you, I'm going to add this into the chat for everyone to see. Uh, in the spring of 2021, we published an in-depth feature report on called Asian Media on the Front Lines, in which we highlighted how AAPI community media were responding to converging crises of COVID-19, hate crimes epidemic, hunger, and widespread disinformation. From Filipino and Malayali nurses to Fujianese food delivery workers to Punjabi meat processing plant workers to Vietnamese nail salon technicians to Korean grocery store clerks to Nepali and Bangladeshi domestic and family care workers, AAPI manned every front line of the pandemic. Their in language news sources told their stories and gave their communities concrete ways to support them from organizing housing for delivery workers who had lived in shuttered restaurants to meal delivery and food drives for the hungry and transport to vaccine appointments for the elderly. Pacifica communities experienced more than twice the rate of infection in many of the Midwestern states where they live. And although they lack in language and community media resources, the few uh, outlets that exist to serve them did cover their experiences, even as traditional local news failed entirely to cover them. Final slide. What is the way forward for us and for community media? I think we can learn from this conversation that AAPI media, AAPI communities remain underserved in mainstream media, but also that many remain underserved in AAPI community media itself. Many news outlets shut down during the COVID-19 crisis and lockdowns. Many have become vulnerable to disinformation that is pervading the, uh, the internet and specifically targeting uh, AAPI communities from state propaganda arms and non-state bad faith actors. The AAPI community is rapidly growing and changing rapidly. And this necessitates much more culturally relevant and in-language resources than ever before. Data are very poor about AAPI across the board and census participation rates still remain fairly low. AAPI community media are vital, but they are an under-resourced mechanism for reaching vulnerable, marginalized and immigrant AAPI that have multiple comorbidities. We find that many vulnerable communities within the AAPI communities themselves, including LGBTQ people, people from indigenous and tribal backgrounds, caste oppressed people, religious and ethnic minorities that have experienced ethnic cleansing or genocide in countries of origin, many of these communities remain unserved and underserved in the ecosystem as well. I'm so glad to be here. I really appreciate all of your time. Please do stay in touch with me if you're interested in engaging with the Asian media ecosystem or are doing any research that you think might support our ecosystem. Please reach out to me at any time and I'll add my email in the chat as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kavitha. Now we'll hear from Cheryl Thompson Morton, who will discuss how Black media covered the COVID-19 pandemic, and will also share lessons from the sector that can be applied more widely in future public health crises. All right. Thank you all so much for having me today. Very excited to be a part of this illustrious panel, um, and thank you to uh, the organizers for having us today. So uh, my name is Cheryl, and I lead a project called the Black Media Initiative. I'm a colleague of Kavita, so that's why the names are so similar. Um, and today, I want to discuss with you all what we can learn from Black media when covering public health crises. So in 2021, we published a report titled Why Black Media Matters Now. This study was a comparative analysis between Black and mainstream media and ran from March of 2020 through May of 2021. The report is really rich in findings from the research team, so I hope you'll have a chance to review it after this call. However, we can distill all of the findings into three major buckets or themes, all of which I think have lessons for us in communicating around public health crises. First is that Black media provides greater coverage of issues that disproportionately affect African Americans, and they cover these topics earlier than mainstream media. Second, 
Black media centers the humanity of people in their coverage in a way that is distinct from mainstream media. And finally, Black media connects current news events to the larger fight for justice and historical context in this nation. So let's dive right in by starting uh, by talking about the topics that Black media covers more. When it came to COVID coverage, Black media wrote five times more than mainstream media on the disproportionate racial impact of the pandemic and nearly twice as much as mainstream media on frontline and essential workers. Black media covered also a variety of health issues of particular relevance to Black communities at higher levels than mainstream media, including maternal health, hypertension, diabetes, HIV and AIDS, and sickle cell disease. On subjects related to race, Black media not only had consistently higher levels of coverage than mainstream media, but also put focus on key race-related stories earlier in the news cycle than mainstream media. An example where we saw this trend clearly was the coverage of the disproportionate racial impact of COVID, um, as well as coverage of Breonna Taylor, which is uh, another topic we cover extensively um, in this report. So as noted earlier, the coverage levels of the disproportionate racial impact of the pandemic were five times higher in Black media than in mainstream media. Examining the daily coverage levels over time, Black media's coverage quickly climbed to a peak of nearly 2.5% of all stories published within the first month of the pandemic. By April 8th, coverage had reached a primary peak of nearly 7.5% of all stories. At the same time, mainstream media was only starting to cover this issue, with less than 1% of stories mentioning it. Mainstream media did not reach a peak of coverage of the issue until two months later on June 6th. Even then, coverage was less than 3% for all stories. The next topic I want to discuss is how Black media centers the community in their coverage. So looking at the language frequently used in stories about topics at scale, a trend emerges where words used frequently and uniquely by Black media show a humanization of the people involved in or impacted by the news. All of the following terms were part of the top 100 words of Black media's coverage and not in the top words for mainstream media. We saw the word care come up in social distancing, anti-masking, mass incarceration, immigration, political coverage, sexism, and Me Too. We saw the term pain come up in coverage of sickle cell disease and suffer and suffering in coverage of diabetes and hypertension. Obviously the word black was consistently used um, and we saw this um, around a variety of topics and was uniquely prevalent when compared to the top words used by mainstream media. The only topics where mainstream media did include black in the top words was vaccine hesitancy, long COVID, disproportionate racial impact, and comorbidities and risk factors. So we see it's a very limited scope um, when we're talking about um, black folks uh, in their relation to COVID-19. We also see references to the community and family are uniquely prevalent in Black media as compared to mainstream media across subject areas. Black media centers women, both as a collective and individually, reporting across subject areas in a way that uh, mainstream media doesn't. And Black media also uniquely focused on children, youth, schools, and students across subject areas. Um, and those terms were most frequently used in Black media really across a variety of topics. And we didn't see that uh, when we looked at mainstream media. The next thing I wanna talk about that Black media does uniquely is connect news events to wider issues of justice. So through our research, we saw evidence of Black media creating narrative arcs that connect news events across subjects with a core and common focus on an issue of injustice. Issues are covered from a systemic frame, which is often unique for mainstream media. So Black media had the term suppression in the top 100 words for political coverage. Importantly, Black media covered the issue of voting access to coverage of COVID, the pandemic, health, as well as racism. And coverage of COVID, health, racism, Juneteenth, and Black Lives Matter 
voting was among the top 100 most frequently used words by Black media. We also see across topic areas, but particularly in the coverage of health, Black media emphasize threats to or inadequacy to food, housing, and education, often grouping them together narratively. The language used uh, that Black media used most frequently in the coverage of criminal justice evidences a frame beyond news events and instead focuses on systemic historical legacies that persist into current injustices. For example, justice and systemic are uniquely in the top words in Black media's coverage of police shootings. Poverty is uniquely prevalent in Black media's coverage of mass incarceration, as are Jim Crow and lynching. In COVID coverage, the term prison and prisons were among the top 100 most frequently used words in Black media's coverage of social distancing, testing, and comorbidities and risk factors, which was not the case in mainstream media. Finally, the concept of access was a clear focus in Black media's coverage of the pandemic and health overall, which was not echoed in mainstream media. Access was among the top 100 most frequently used words in coverage of vaccines, vaccine hesitancy, testing, essential workers, disproportionate racial impact, and impact on learning. It also was uniquely prevalent in Black media's coverage of other health issues as well. Um, and finally, we see the word disparities show up in Black media, but not in mainstream media in coverage of things like diabetes, hypertension, and HIV and AIDS, even though there have been clear health inequities in all of those areas. Black media not only connects news events across topics and reporting, but also prevent, uh, presents events in the historical record, helping to keep track of the Black experience. So the Tuskegee experiment was prominently featured in Black media's coverage of medical mistrust and distrust. Jim Crow was emphasized in coverage of mass incarceration. Lynching was included in coverage of slavery and Juneteenth. Even the word history itself was uniquely prevalent across Black media, across a diversity of topics. So what lessons can we take from Black media's coverage uh, for our coverage of public health crises? First, we have to cover uh, the aspect of the crisis that are impacting communities' daily lives and address their immediate concerns as it relates to the crisis. Second, use humanizing language and also don't dismiss the concerns that the community has, but work to address them. And then finally, public health crises don't happen in a vacuum. So we have to make sure that we're situating our communication within the broader condition of the community. So thanks so much for your time. Uh, happy to answer any questions, but also excited to hear from the other panelists. Awesome, thank you so much, Cheryl. So up next, we have Ebony Blanding who will discuss visual communication and storytelling through the lens of historically marginalized youth. Ebony? Thank you all so much. I'm so grateful to be here and I'm um, here about all of the wonderful things that everyone is doing. Um, I am representing Reimagine Atlanta. Uh, Reimagine is um, an organization that equips the next generation of representative storytellers. Uh, our vision is a safe, inclusive and equitable workforce in the creative media industry. And our core values are authenticity, community responsibility. Um, problems we are working on, working towards solving are economic inequality in the city of Atlanta. I'm sure all of you all hear about all of the great things that um, Atlanta is doing, but there are so many disparities in regards to just like pay income and the gaps of just meeting opportunities. So Reimagine is here to really bridge that gap. Uh, one of my favorite sayings um, is the South got something to say. Um, if you all have the pleasure of being familiar with Outkast, uh, Andre 3K, uh, Three Stacks, this was one of his quotes that he said at an award ceremony. Um, I live by this, I'm a Southern girl. Um, so what we really represent and what we represent for all of the young folks who come to us is letting them know that they have something to say and we are here to just be a channel uh, for them to do so. I'm going to go back to this slide. Um, our team for Reimagine Productions um, is made of creative team leaders who are professionals, um, who have rich experiences. Uh, we believe in staying inspired and to never stop creating. Uh, Rihanna, she is a producer and photographer, 
Uh, she's really a point of contact for Reimagined Productions. Um, she's in charge of planning the story, the development, uh, the business budget uh, decisions that most folks don't like dealing with, but she loves spreadsheets. Um, and she works from pre to post production. Myself, I'm a writer director um, and on our projects, what I do is I typically work with the youth apprentice um, and they are shadowing me while I direct. And so we do it together. We co-direct as well as write the stories and the treatments for the different and various projects we have to do. Uh, Makai is a brilliant director of photography. Um, he lenses all of our work um, and also we have apprentices who shadow him. So in every facet of production, we have a team leader and then um, an apprentice who's able to shadow and be able to put it on their portfolio of all the dope things that they're doing. Um, Reimagine the future of visual communication and storytelling through the lens of youth. Um, honestly, with Reimagine, I'm, I'm super proud of us because whatever level you're coming in at, you're allowed to really grow in real time. Whereas like some fellowships and some like apprenticeships, you have to either have like graduated from somewhere or obviously know someone is who you know sometimes in this industry or be at a certain type of level where you can even get entrance into a program. Here we take you when you are at your greenest um, and also if you have a portfolio that is budding. So we have room for everyone. Um, so yeah, that visual, and I'll be sure to share it in the chat. Sorry, that's not playing, but it was pretty much a reel that documented all of the amazing organizations and companies that we work from anywhere from like NBC to local organizations that uh, do food pantries, um, all tiers of organizations, as we know, need advertising and commercial work done. So um, our apprentices go out in real time. They meet with the clients um, from pre to post-production, they are involved in the process of creating content. Um, our organization trains and supports local and creative media storytelling among youth by, and I'll get to that on another slide, but programmatically we have different buckets, anywhere from documentary to commercial, to photography, to animation, um, all of the different storytelling components we are involved in. Um, our observation since COVID-19 began, some of the more like high level ones that we've noticed is we used to have opportunities to go into some of the studios, like we have screen gyms here, um, and we would like get walkthroughs and tours and folks would actually be able to go on set and shadow people. Um, obviously, COVID has shifted how business is done and um, it's kind of like, there's really no going back to business as usual. This is the new way that things are done. So the access point to get in some of these places um, has kind of dipped off a bit. Um, also, too, just from like an apprentice standpoint with our youth, we've noticed that um, whereas they might have had like a, a car that they could use from family members to get to and uh, from set and different opportunities and jobs, uh, the limitations now with having a car because finances, um, having to put gas and not necessarily uh, getting paid in real time on these jobs, like some jobs are net 30. So just being able to really like navigate how um, in their own homes, some of the access have shifted for them to be able to uh, create sustainable careers. And also from an industry level, things have shifted drastically. Um, some recommendations we have on expanding skills across the public um, as it regards to what we do is, I always like to say that like, when people say I'm telling stories for folks, uh, what we really believe is people have the authority and the agency to tell their own stories. Um, and so just really being able to let people know that in working in media, um, it's less about us telling folks stories and more about like telling stories with people and opening up the opportunity for it to be just kind of a transactional narrative, um, whereas people can feel like they have their voice being amplified. Um, also, two expanding skills across uh, the public is really amplifying and letting folks know that uh, Black and BIPOC folks um, have the skill set, have 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 the desire to work in industry at a top of the line standpoint. Um, and when I say top of the line, I mean like you have um, folks who work in like the creative decision making. A lot of times when black and BIPOC folks are brought onto productions is typically um, obviously through an entry point. But what we notice is a lot of times we stay there for at length that some of our other counterparts, our white counterparts don't have to. So just being able to understand and um, 
really ground folks in understanding that um, they're equipped, they're ready to do the work, and they have opportunities to grow and they need those opportunities uh, to, to really maximize their potential. Um, our workforce development uh, pipeline, um, we, exposure, we've had over 440 students served. Um, our training looks like over 940 training hours for high school fellows and apprentices. So in real time, we're going into um, high schools that are all across our counties doing workshops with teachers about media training. Um, we just did a get out from the film, uh, a whole like simulation of the scene where the person is doing hypnosis that everyone loved. Uh, so just really being able to get in classrooms and also bring people into our office to do uh, creative work and training. Uh, placement, we've had over six, we've had 16 apprentices who have secured constant work. Um, that number is very important and the wording with that is very important. Consistent meaning like they are on the payroll right now. Um, some of them are getting benefits depending on where they land and how they fall. Uh, but the fact that like they are constantly working at these organizations opposed to gig work. Program highlights, um, our apprenticeship cohort trainings throughout the year. Um, one of those highlights was a collab with the Swiss uh, consulate. Like they came over, uh, they did this beautiful documentary about Savannah. Um, our students were able to do some shadowing work and also just like talk to someone in real time of what it looks like to sustain a career in documentary filmmaking, because we have a lot of amazing documentary folks in our program. Uh, paid uh, work opportunities, uh, one of those was, was at a three-day conference at the Hyatt. Um, they were able to stay at the Hyatt, able to order room service, like they, they just felt like complete superstars as they are. Um, and also teacher trainings and in-studio uh, things. We do like podcast training. Um, we have like sessions where we go and we do um, sound archives and go around the community so we can get Foley sounds and truly understand like all of the elements that it takes to create a production. Uh, more about the crew. Uh, the production of our visuals um, are typically like mentorship opportunity, opportunities within themselves. We have um, about three to six apprentices that we we'll have for case by case basis. Um, our priority of the project, our projects are to have BIPOC uh, representation of the production side of the camera. Um, our goal is to make sure we have more seasoned production crew fostering onset moments for their apprentices to learn about the different aspects of filming. Um, in addition to the teens and young adults being featured on camera, our apprentices are hired on as production assistants and they support with everything from using the equipment to setting up lighting uh, to working with the subjects who are being filmed. Um, this is just some creative elements that we have for our marketing plan. Um, each opportunity that we have to do visuals for different organizations, our apprentices go through all of the different elements that it takes to make um, to make this creative happen. Um, and so these are just some elements from interviews to voiceovers to establishing shots and B-roll to establishing the narrative tone. So when we go in and we get the brief from the uh, client that wants to hire us, we take an apprentice with us, we do our pitching and allow for them to just kind of get very used to getting in front of folks um, and showing why they are equipped to tell the story. Um, our partnership ecosystem, um, as you can see, uh, we're in the middle, um, the yellow icon, and all around us are the different partners that we've worked with anywhere from Adobe, um, Atlanta Public Schools, um, on the other side, we have Georgia State University. Right now, in real time, we're working on a project with Microsoft that's going to be amazing about Black and BIPOC, BIPOC folks in STEM and the representation that um, is needed more. Um, and also, we work with Disney and NBC Universal. Um, and thank you all so much for holding space. Uh, we're super, super fortunate to be doing this work. Um, and we are excited about what the future holds for uh, youth storytellers. Thank y'all. All right, thank you so very much. We will now hear from Sally Lehrman with the Trust Project who will discuss the problems identified in mainstream news coverage about COVID-19 and how the eight trust indicators can help newsrooms and the public center trustworthy or more trustworthy about news. If you do have questions, please drop them in the chat. We will make sure that we send out those responses in our email to you after. Sally, it's all up on you now. Thank you. Thanks so much. And what fantastic presentations and um, really interesting. 
I want to, I'm going to try to cover maybe not all of that because we only have a few minutes and maybe there's time for, maybe there'll be time for questions, I hope. Um, but what we were hearing about is, is the importance of community media and ethnic media. What, what I want to emphasize is sort of the urgency of supporting community and ethnic media, and in fact, all media um, covering um, BIPOC and um, other communities. So um, let me just start, as, I, as you know, I represent the Trust Project. And what we are doing is working to build a more trusted and trustworthy press. And we are working with um, news organizations across all shapes and sizes, um, for instance, from the BBC to Osage News. And um, let me see, sorry, I had to get my thing going. I just want to say quickly, what we know is that people really do want trustworthy news. But what is happening, and you can see it's from this huge study that we did and actually led by Ipsos, this big research form, firm. Um, but what we see happening is even though there's a lot of confidence about spotting false information, um, in fact, there may, that may be overconfidence. And as um, trust in news declines, um, no matter what people's confidence is, uh, misinformation just floods in. And so we are in this moment where people are seeking out trustworthy news, but it's very hard for them to tell the difference between trustworthy news and all the other information out there um, and as a result, I think communities of color hurt the most because they are um, being targeted by this false information, um, both as a way of kind of undermining these communities as well as ways a way of um, well as a way of building division across difference. So we've done quite a bit of research at the Trust Project trying to understand audiences. And the thing that popped out the most to me from our 2020 interviews was just this anxiety. People, uh, you can probably relate to this, are emotionally exhausted by the news. It's depressing, it's discouraging, it's hard. And this one person told us, we're looking for information that we can actually act on. Um, overwhelmed um, and overwhelmed by this feeling, I have to sort through all this and I don't know if it's real or not, even though I may think I'm pretty good at sorting it, you can just start believing this fa these falsehoods. Searching for diversity. So recognizing this is across all uh, many different types of users, looking for um, different perspectives as they try to sort through this. And this means from um, various different demographic groups as well as ideological difference. Um, so, I think what might be helpful as we talk about this, these issues is thinking about what are, um, what are the different audiences that we are trying to reach and how might we best reach them? Um, and as we think about issues like COVID-19, um, we have, I think there's some very strong similarities from the way, pub, between the way public health um, communicators think about audiences and the way we think about audiences, we hope that we can add to that by showing you um, the way we've differentiated them through our research. So in um, 2016, we went out and talked to communities uh, across race, class, gender, generation, and geography in the US and Europe. And we asked them, what is it you value in the news and how do you decide whether to trust it? Um, because we were trying to figure out how do we communicate the trustworthiness of a given news source. And so we came across, across all of our interviews, which were um, what I call ethnographic light. So we really went and talked to people. We didn't, um, we didn't just do a survey. We went and asked people these questions and watched them and listened to them. So there were four users types. One was the AVID. Um, this is Alex. She lives in Detroit. She also works in New York. She's out there checking and cross-checking the news. She says, I do not understand why people don't read the news. You might as well put your finger in the light socket. Then we have what we call the engaged newsers, users. And um, this is Alma. She works at the public library and she 
says, I want news that's nutritionally fit. Every time I read an article, I have more questions and that's good. She wants news to be kind of a, like a library, but she feels overwhelmed by the amount that's there. Also undercovered, like where did, she doesn't see herself often enough, uh, but she still subscribes to the news and pays a lot of attention to it. Wendy here lives in Arizona. Um, she lives with her in-laws because she's her husband's out of a job. She's got a couple of children. You can see why she doesn't have a lot of time to be checking the news. And we call her opportunistic because she's just there when the news is there to for her, like at the um, maybe at the break room at work or uh, a notification on her phone. But she still sees the value. News is there to tell us what's going on around the world, around the neighborhood, and as she put it, like to help us do better as a community. And then in this early research. We also ran across what we called the angry disengaged. And this is the group we, we worry about a lot, of course, because at that time they had just checked out of the news entirely. Now in more recent research, we find that they are actually engaged with um, misinformation and disinformation. Now, what we found in our most recent research, um, and as I was showing you across all that anxiety, everyone also has moved up in their engagement with the news. So somebody like Wendy now is looking at the news a couple times a day, as opposed to just whenever it hits her. And Alma might be a little bit more like um, the avid news user um, and angry, disengaged, connected with misinformation, as I said. So what, my, what I really want everyone to just think about here is where is the opportunity? Where should we be intervening and across all of our news media? And I really would point to this middle group because over here, unfortunately, we've, we've lost a lot of people who have just kind of gone into, um, at least for now, a lot of conspiracy theories and such. In the middle, we have people who really are looking to the news to try to um, to orient themselves and address public health issues um, in their own communities, in their own lives. Um, but they feel overwhelmed and a bit lost. Like, how, And so we can reach out to them. And that is where um, our focus on these eight trust indicators, I think, can help. So what we did in our original research was, again, ask people, why do they value the news? Or, and when do they value it? And how can they decide whether to trust it? And these key questions emerge in terms of how they think about it. One is asking news organizations, what is your agenda? Like we understand you aim to be impartial, but what's your agenda? And for community media, I think that's very clear, it's to serve the community. Other news organizations um, have more work to do. I think we all have some work to do around, well, how do we actually do that? And what are the, what are the guardrails that keep us from being unduly influenced by um, businesses, maybe that advertise or um, government agencies or um, some of these politicians, for instance. So um, that's key. Diverse perspectives. I put it up high in all my presentations because it came up so often across multiple um, types of people. People look to the news media both to understand themselves and to understand other people. They really see the value of news there. We heard that over and over. Um, the journalist, information about who is this journalist, uh, where are they coming from, do they know me, do they know my community, what am I looking at, is news and opinion separated, or is it blended together and then I can't really tell whether it's a fact I can trust, or something that someone's just sort of pushing on me, as someone said, um, how do you know what you know, journalists, so expectations for not just attribution of sources, but actual uh, maybe links that I can follow or we now have asked sites to put references at the bottom of some stories. Locally sourced, that gets again to, do you know me? Do you know my community, um, both geographically and demographically? Were you here? Um, let me participate. We heard a bit from others about how important that is in community media um, and how many types of news media can learn from community media there, which is, Engagement is key. People don't just want to be passive con consumers. And I think that's been one way that news media really has gone wrong in um, kind of thinking of people that way. 
So we have developed, sorry about my slides here. We've developed eight trust indicators that we encourage all news organizations to use on their sites. And then we, you can apply to be part of the trust project in order to get our training and guidance on them and actually earn uh, the trust mark that says you have done this. But they respond to those eight things. So those guardrails, who's behind the news? How are we, what are the guardrails that we use? More about the journalists. Do they speak, what languages do they speak? Where do they live? Labels, again, separating news from opinion, references. Um, I won't go into all of these, but I think that these are um, core ways that both news organizations can step up to this urgent challenge right now and revealing who and, and what is behind their work um, and then specifically diverse voices is an area that we focus on uh, that I want to emphasize for this group um, because we are trying to build structural ways across news organizations to pay more attention here. And one is we ask every news organizations to state their commitment to inclusion in those best practices. So what are they really doing to diversify their voices in the news and um, their coverage. And we even ask um, community news organizations to do that. So for example, Osage News, which covers um, the Osage Nation and all their population throughout the United States. We ask them, well, how are you diversifying and what does that mean to you within your community? Um, and then providing staff data on that. And then also in coverage, this is where uh, I was going to talk more about the way the ways that mainstream media has gone wrong, and I think we've seen some examples of how community journalism has done well, but could do better, and that is covering disparities in health and other areas as a structural issue, not a personal choice. So not just thinking of inequity as the data, we see these differences, but looking at, well, why do these differences exist? And going up the ladder of the social determinants of health to community structures, institutional policies, and even um, structural uh, inequities across uh, social division and social hierarchies. And that's where I'd like to, um, I mean, we are encouraging our journalists to, to go further there. So thanks for the time. I hope that whirlwind um, introduction was useful. Thank you, Sally, so very much. I'd like to invite our panelists back to the stage for our Q&A. We have had a few questions come in, so I will read the first one. It says, how can public health institutions better collaborate with citizen journalists and community media organizations? And feel free to jump in. You know, one thing I wanted to explore a little bit is, so I mentioned before in my presentation that community media in general, but Asian media in as well are extremely under-resourced and, and dealing with tremendous, tremendous resource strain. Um, so one of our core functions at CCM is to really figure out innovative new revenue models and revenue streams for community media. One thing we see in the Asian media ecosystem is that the ecosystem was really designed to meet the needs of a certain group of a certain people in a certain stage of life, upwardly mobile, highly skilled, upper, you know, uh, upper status, upper class, upper caste, um, you know, immigrants who had uh, access to resources. But that landscape has changed tremendously and that generation from the 1965 generation is also aging. So the needs, the public health needs are quite high. And we have seen some really great success with public health researchers partnering with community media outlets to fundraise to collect data that are missing. For example, there's a Filipino news um, media outlet, community media outlet, I think one of maybe three community media outlets for Filipino Americans that offers in language Tagalog um, resources around COVID-19 and public health, and they were able to effectively partner with the CDC Foundation to conduct the first ever national survey of vaccine attitudes in the Filipino American community. So they're able to build data journalism around that work and then also meet the needs of their public health scholar partner, who is also trying to understand how best to engage the Filipino community around vaccines. Something like this could not only provide powerful resources, much sorely needed resources to community media, but could also generate data that will really help the public public health field move forward on its needs as well.
Thank you. And I'd love to hear from Ebony if you have any perspective on how a public health organization could partner with an organization like Reimagine working with youth from historically marginalized communities. Absolutely. Um, I think one of the ways would be to really allow for the youth to do some storytelling around um, vaccines and the COVID pandemic and all of those things that folks perhaps have had misinformation about um, in a way that relates to their communities. Um, I think no one knows their communities better than the folks who are in them. So really allowing them to have agency to, to craft some narrative around that, I think would be um, a very... Um, dynamic way to, to get people to have some level of trust and engagement. Um, and I see it in real time in the community that I stay in. I stay in a historically black neighborhood in West End of Atlanta. And there's an organization called uh, Community Builders. And they go door to door. Uh, we trust them because they look like us. They look like my family. Um, and they talk to us and they engage us with some of the youth as well as some of the elders to talk to us about how to protect ourselves um, and how to advocate ourselves in the medical complex all over. Thank you. And Ms. Duncan, what are some ways that public health organizations could partner with BronxNet TV to support your community? Um, yes, I think I mentioned um, we partner on events, um, fitness events where the public is drawn in and then. Um, once people attend those events, we are able to provide them with more information about BronxNet as well as about the health issues and the health institutions. I think we also, we reach out to health organizations um, when we think that a particular issue is important and we make sure the conversation is two ways because we feel like sometimes with the big institutions, we've had, a, I guess, a lot of experience out there over the years on the ground. So I think we know um, some of the things people are thinking about. So together we come up with plans for content that we really think is going to reach the people of the Bronx. Thank you. And one final question, how has social media been leveraged to help citizen journalists amplify their work and uplift the concerns of community members? And I do, while you're pondering on that question, I'll call out Sally's comment that she would encourage public health communicators to work with community, community media on sharing the social determinants of health, even in breaking news stories. Thank you, Sally. So any examples of social media and how citizen journalists and community media have used it to amplify stories? We would love to hear those if you have them. So we just recently uh, entered into a partnership with the Asian American Digital Politics Collective, which is really looking at not just how influencers and digital um, sort of digital actors are spreading disinformation in the community, but how community media can use social media to kind of push back against some of these stories. And we've seen um, some really powerful work. You know, it's been challenging during the Shanghai uh, anti-COVID lockdown protests, a lot of Chinese language media had to leave WeChat, but they've now made their way into TikTok. So we're seeing quite a lot of really powerful organizing and storytelling happening in TikTok around Chinese language media. Um, and Twitter is also turned, it's a, you know, Twitter's going through whatever transformations it's going through right now, but it has become a very powerful organizing space for anti-caste activism in the South Asian media, which has a ton of comorbidities with, um, with, with, um, with public health outcomes in the South Asian community as well. Okay, thank you so very much. So that wraps our Q&A for today. I want to remind you that there will be a replay of this conversation on our YouTube channel. We already have our past two community conversations streaming there now. You can also follow us on Twitter. If you would like to join our final community conversation, you can just take your cell phone, scan the QR code here. That's happening April 13th from one to two. And that will discuss arts coping and healing during public health crises, lessons learned from project refocused community partners. We want to, of course, if you have 
an opportunity. If you want to collaborate with our project, you can reach us at projectrefocus at howard.edu. Thank you to our Howard and UCLA teams and also for our CDC, CDC Foundation and our project partners. And just wanna thank you all so very much for your participation in today's conversation. You all have a great rest of your day.